Hi, my name is Morgan and I am a neuroscience researcher. And before I even get started with this video, I just want to say thank you so, so much to all of the new subscribers. I, at the time of filming this video, am at 96 subscribers and there's a real possibility that I'll hit 100, which is so many more than I ever thought that I would. I promise I have something really big planned for whenever I hit 100. So keep an eye out for that video. Hopefully it'll be like next week. Um, so I'm really excited for that. And like I said, keep an eye out. I think probably my last Big Bang Theory video is what brought in a lot of people. So if you would like to see more content like that, or there's any specific type of content that you would like to see, please feel free to leave it in comment down below or send me an email at askaneuroresearcher at gmail.com. I am here for you to ask your neuroscience questions too. With all of the new subscribers, I thought it was probably time for me to talk about what exactly it is that I do and what it is that neuroscientists do because I know with researchers there's a lot of ambiguity of what exactly it is that we're sitting in a lab all day doing and I think it's probably something that you might like to know. I am really curious how many of my subscribers are neuroscientist or psychologist or some sort of brain person or how many of you are just interested in the brain so i'm gonna leave two pinned comments down below one asking if you are a brain person and one if you are just someone casually interested in the brain just to sort of get an idea of what my audience is so if you could like whichever one you are even if you're not a subscriber if you're just casually stumbling upon this video let me know I put on my lab coat today to film this video, so hopefully I look a little bit more official, maybe a little bit more like a researcher than I normally do. Um, but yeah, so I get asked what I do or what researchers in general, neuroscientists in general do pretty frequently, basically anytime I mention that's what I wanna do or that's what I am doing, just because I think there is a lot of uh, misinformation about what researchers do, because if you think about the main scientific jobs that you see in like film and in media um you see the researchers who have like totally wild findings who are doing kind of insane stuff they get a lot of publicity because the media thinks that's interesting in movies you get researchers who are doing things that are not what we do which is why i've been doing these reaction videos so i mean check out some of my reaction videos i'll leave one up here somewhere or you get like the mad scientist trope a lot i think that's what most of us are characterized as which i will say scientists are weird like that's i wouldn't say we're all evil because <laughs> we're not but we are all very strange i think every scientist has their own like little quirks that you have to kind of get used to sometimes but what is it that we do in real life i think the first thing that people tend to think whenever i say that i'm a neuroscientist they automatically think neurosurgeon neurologist psychiatrist psychologist therapist somewhere along those lines which i am not so neurologists and neurosurgeons are both medical professions. They um, have to go to medical school to do that. Um, I would say some of us do consider ourselves a little bit of a neurosurgeon because a lot of us, like I do a lot of rat and mouse neurosurgeries. So in that context, yes, I am. But if you gave me a human with an open skull, I don't know that I could really do much with it. Um, and I wouldn't want to ever. <laughs> I remember I had a professor one time who said on the very first day of class, very right off the bat, that he is a neuroscientist, he has studied the brain a lot, he will not diagnose any of your family members with a mental illness. And I was like, that's an odd, like, quirky thing to say. But no, it's something that we get asked pretty frequently because people equate us with psychologists and psychiatrists. But we study the brain on a more um, molecular level. And so, yes, there are some of us who study mental illness. I am one of the ones who studies mental illness. But we don't, I could not diagnose you and I could not treat you. I am more focused on figuring out what exactly is going on in your brain, but I can't like really talk to you through anything like how a therapist would. So if we're not doing any of those things, what is it that we do? I would say that most neuroscientists are researchers. We mostly are in labs studying the brain. Researchers also tend to be professors because like universities won't really hire you if you're not willing to also teach. And some of us, I, for example, really want to be a professor and also do research. Some people are less inclined towards that. If people don't want to teach, sometimes they go into industry, which is a form of doing research, um, most likely for a privately owned company or for like a big pharma type situation. 
than uh, working at a university. Sometimes neuroscientists will also work as consultants and science communicators. And so, for example, that's what I'm trying to do with this YouTube channel. Uh, there's some neuroscientists who have podcasts, some who go on the news all the time to try to explain our field a little bit better. So when you're a researcher, like I said, you typically have two kind of options. One is academia and one is industry. So academia is sort of your stereotypical prof uh, researcher slash professor. You work for a university, whether a private university or a public university, it doesn't matter. Um, and then you also typically teach and you have grad students and undergrads and all of that fun stuff. Uh, in industry, you're more likely to work for a privately owned company. Like I said, Big Pharma, um, Elon Musk has a team of neuroscientists working on something. I have a video on that. I'll link it up here somewhere. Um, so there's a lot of options. Industry is a little bit more secretive, I would say, than academia because honestly, most of us in academia have no clue what people in industry do. So if you're a neuroscientist working in industry, please reach out to me. I would love to talk to you. I I will be completely honest on this channel. I probably won't touch on industry very often because honestly, I, I don't have much to say about it because I don't know that much about it. Maybe in the future that will change. Academia is a little bit easier to envision because it's the process that we all have to go through. So in order to become a scientist, you have to go to college and then you're around professors. And then you also have to go to grad school, again, around professors with a professor as a mentor. So it's one that we've been exposed to and we know more about just naturally through having to go through the process. So to get more specific about what I do, I am currently a graduate student trying to get my PhD in neuroscience. And that means that I'm working as a researcher. Um, in the future, I might become a mentor to an undergrad. And I am also attempting to be a science communicator with this channel. So that's our job. That's what we technically do. But it also doesn't really say much. I mean, professors, we can kind of figure out what they do. But what does a researcher do? I mean, we research, but what does that even mean? Are we saying they're reading papers all day? No, hopefully not. I probably would not do this if I had to read papers all day. So being a neuroscientist is somehow both a highly specific field and also a very general field. Because in order to become a neuroscientist, we have to study the entire brain. So I know very general knowledge about most of the brain. But also whenever you get into your research, you get extremely specific into like a teeny, teeny, tiny area of the brain. It can also be very general because the brain connects to your entire body like your your whole body is controlled by your brain i think um if i remember right from physiology your heart can beat on its own but it's still technically connected to your brain and as far as i know that's it i mean there's some people who think that the gut has sort of its own brain not so much like a in Oregon, but it kind of like thinks for itself but there's even neuroscientists who study that so neuroscientists study anything that connects to the brain. I studied eyes one time as a neuroscientist because your eyes are a direct connection to your brain. So I'm going to put up like a big list over here of what I can think of off the top of my head that neuroscientists study. But seriously, we study everything and at the same time, very specific things. I think one of the most annoying questions that I get asked uh, is changed a little bit recently, but a lot of people, whenever they think of research, they think of cancer research, which cancer research is very important, very necessary, and there are neuroscientists who work on cancer research, but I am not one of those, and I would argue that the majority of scientists are not cancer researchers. So um, I think a better question to ask people instead of just immediately asking us if we work on cancer. Just ask us, what do you study? What, what's your field? What are you studying right now? And that would be a little bit better. More recently, people have switched to asking if I study COVID, which again, I do not. Um, there are some neuroscientists who have switched over to studying COVID, but I am not one of those. And again, the majority of us are not one of those. It's people whose labs were already sort of equipped to do that kind of thing who switched over to it. So again, what do I specifically do? My current project is focused on studying females. Females are extremely understudied, specifically in neuroscience. I mean, we're understudied everywhere, but there's been a lot of reports lately about how neuroscience is kind of one of the worst fields about studying it. And I personally think because of all of the fields, it is kind of one of the more male-dominated ones. I mean, all of science is already male-dominated. Neuroscience is pretty male dominated. And there's a lot of researchers who make the argument of, well, females have hormones, so we can't study things with hormones. 
which is a bad argument, especially coming from a neuroscientist, because all of us have hormones, all of us have every hormone. There's no different hormone that females have that males don't have. And there's actually a lot of research coming out now that males have a hormone cycle as well as females. So I won't go into too much of a rant about that. Leave a comment down below if you'd like to hear me rant more about female research. But um, I study females. I also study oxytocin, which is commonly known as the love hormone. It does a lot more than love and relationships, but that's what it's most commonly known as. And I study dopamine, which is a part of our brain's reward systems and makes us feel good and happy. A question that you might want to ask if you are considering becoming a neuroscientist is how much does a neuroscientist make? A lot of people, because neurosurgeons exist and neurosurgeons are kind of like the top oh my god, they make so much money, aside from like celebrities, that people just assume that if you do neuroscience things, first of all, they assume that you're really smart, which no, we're not. We just know a lot about the brain. But also they assume that we make a lot of money, which we don't. We make the same amount that every other researcher does. So to throw out specific numbers, grad students, specifically PhD students, usually make a stipend. And our stipend, depending on where you're going to school at, is between 28,000 to 35,000. And then PIs, which stands for Principal Investigator, which is essentially our boss, usually professors and researchers, make somewhere between 34 to 78,000 in academia. And in industry, their starting salary is usually upwards of 100,000. To give an example, I have not worked for a PI who makes less than 90,000, but I have also worked for extremely well-established PIs, so that's not necessarily their starting salary. So if all of this sounds like something that you would be interested in, or it sounds like maybe fun, uh, how in the world would you become a neuroscientist? According to the YouTube analytics, my main audience is somewhere between 18 years old to 35 years old, so I'm going to give the whole range starting from high school. Very first step, graduate high school, preferably with good grades. Second step, go to college, also preferably with good grades. While you're in college, you want to start volunteering in labs. Whenever you volunteer in labs, you're a volunteer. You're not going to get paid. Someone who has never done neuroscience research is not likely to get paid, but you're also not likely to land a job if you've never done the research, so you have to volunteer. And you don't have to volunteer in a neuroscience specific lab. I went to a college that did not have any neuroscience labs. And so I had to just volunteer in kind of a very general one that like happened to be working with the brain. You also don't have to major in neuroscience. You can major, I majored in biology and physiology and a lot of people also major in psychology. So it doesn't really matter what your undergraduate major is in as long as it is a science and you do some sort of research while you're there. After you graduate from college, you're going to want to start applying to graduate schools. Even if you don't think you're gonna get in the first round, it's a really good idea to start applying as early as possible so you get used to the admissions process. If you don't get in on the first round, I highly recommend becoming a research tech. I have a video that I'll link somewhere up here about being a research tech and what all that means, but essentially you would be working in a lab full time. Becoming a research tech shows that you're committed to the science field and that it wasn't just sort of a phase. It also helps you work full time while you're also working on your skills and your resume. If you do get into grad school, congrats. Uh, you are going to want to either be in a master's or a PhD program. If you're trying to become a professor, you are going to have to transition to PhD at some point to be able to have your own lab and do your own research. Then you graduate from grad school. Typically, you end up applying for some postdoc positions to uh, further your research knowledge and sort of gain more connections. And then finally, you become either a PI or you go and work for industry. So that's sort of the, the life cycle of becoming a neuroscientist. I am currently in the grad school phase, but I also believe that anyone who has been studying neuroscience for an extended period of time can call themselves a neuroscientist. I mean, there's no clear bar that you have to pass in order to say that you're a neuroscientist. I think personally, I've been doing neuroscience research for five years. I think that's a reasonable period of time to be able to finally call myself a neuroscientist. I would say if you're an undergrad, maybe you're not quite there yet because there are a lot of steps to research that you don't really um, fully comprehend until you're kind of having to come up with your own projects. But some people are way past where most grad students are at in undergrad. It really depends on your mentor and what you're doing. So another question that I get asked a lot about being a neuroscientist um, and about like my future job is just people constantly want to know like, when will you be done with school? <laughs> I think it's a question that a lot of us get asked because you go to college and people expect you to get a job out of college and they're like, 
nope, I'm going to grad school. And then maybe you started a master's program and they're like, okay, well, once you're done with your master's and you're like, nope, still have to go to my PhD. Then you start your PhD that if you're in America, that's going to take you like five years. And so then they're going to be like, okay, well, surely you're done after five years. And then you have to go and do your postdoc most likely. And I mean, in the end, personally, and for most people, we become professors. And so you're never leaving college, essentially, is what I'm trying to say. So why in the world would anyone choose this life? Why would you choose to stay in college forever and to, I don't know, just, just to learn to constantly like, challenge yourself? First of all, I think it is the challenge. I think most people who are willing to do a PhD and who are wanting to stay in research, we enjoy the challenge of trying to learn as much as possible. We're also typically extremely curious people. And so there's a lot of questions that I have that there are no answers for yet. And I wanna be a part of the people who are finding those answers. And then also for neuroscience specifically, I think there's something very alluring about the brain. The brain is the only organ that is able to study itself. And I remember the first time that I heard that, I mean, it's so simple, but it just blew my mind because yeah, it is. And that's absolutely wild. There's also just something that draws you in about them. The first time that I saw a human brain, a rat brain, all, all of the brains, I just, I knew that that's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And that goes for a lot of researchers. I think a lot of us tend to see our research subject and then become almost like hyper fixated on it. And then lastly, I think a lot of people who do research have a personal investment of some sort. So I have a lot of personal connection to the research that I am wanting to do. And that's why I have all of these questions that don't have answers. I mean, aside from personal life experiences, just being a female and seeing how much there is that we don't know about females, but we do know about males, it's really frustrating. <laughs> and I want to be a part of the team that figures out those things. I mean, there's a lot of things that we know in males that we just don't study in females. And so we just extrapolate what we have in males and say, well, it probably goes for females too, but you don't know that, no one knows that until the research is done. So maybe my research eventually I'll find that females are exactly the same as males. There's no sex differences, everything's the same. And that's great, that's fine, but at least we will have the answers. But maybe also I'll find that there's something different. Who knows? So I got onto a bit of a tangent about my project. I'm very passionate about it. There's a reason why I'm willing to spend five years studying it. And I mean, hopefully the rest of my life. But I hope that this video was interesting. Like I said, with the new rise in subscribers, I really wanted to get something out there to say, you know, this channel's Ask a Neuroscientist, but what in the world is a neuroscientist? Who knows what we do? Um, so I hope that maybe this video answers some questions. If you have any questions about what it is that I do or what researchers do, what a neuroscientist is, please feel free to leave them in the comments below. You can email me at askaneuroresearcher at gmail.com. And you can also reach out to me on my social medias, which I'll list right here. Again, thank you so, so much to all of the people who have been subscribing. I truly, truly appreciate it. If you want to share this with people and help me reach 100 subscribers, that would be absolutely amazing. And make sure that you're keeping an eye out for my hitting 100 subscribers video. It's going to be super exciting, super fun. I'm going to have some fun guests on the channel. I'm really pumped for it. It's going to be great. So with that, I will see you next Wednesday. Bye.